Hello, I'm your host, Martin John, The Recovery Mentor. Welcome to the Recover Yourself podcast, where we address topics you'll face while on a journey to recovering yourself. This podcast is all about expanding the definition and scope of how we understand both addiction and recovery. I'm interested in doing this so everyone has an opportunity to recover themselves. This is why no matter where you are on that journey, there is a place for you here. And and we're going to be addressing the definition of addiction very directly today. This is a special episode about the last four years and a president that was in active addiction the entire time. This is not a complaint, nor is it in support. This is just a recognition that we need to have a new national conversation around addiction, what it looks like, and how it affects our world. I want to start by saying I have no complaints about how Donald Trump... Donald Trump did his job. I'm sure that he, uh, with all honesty, did his very best. And although I do expect more from a president, I would never expect more from him. And we're still in denial of it. We're still going out here thinking that he is going to do better tomorrow because we haven't identified the fact that he's an addict. We haven't said outright that Donald Trump is an addict and he's taking us on a road. He's manipulating us. We can see it in everything he does and we're gonna be covering a lot of those things today and how it relates back to addiction. Our ideas around addiction in this country and maybe even in the world are stuck looking at only a handful of substances and behaviors. Now, greed, fame, popularity, education, and a whole host of other addictive associations we can have are never even addressed. Why? because somehow they are seen as healthy. Well, I hope this can wake people up to the fact that quote unquote healthy addictions can really really just leave more uh, wake of destruction because they are supported. And we're gonna talk about all of this stuff today, but it's important just to get it in your head that if Donald Trump wasn't addicted to his own fame and wealth, but he was addicted to crack or heroin, uh, would we continue after everything that he's done to be like, oh no, he's fine, he's got good intentions. The idea that Trump can have good intentions is, it has to be made up. You have to be enabling that idea within yourself because you want to believe something. Because there is nothing that he's done to help us identify the fact that he is capable of change, that he is capable of thinking of anybody but himself. So uh, this is a big, this is a big topic and I want to be able to kind of go through it one step at a time. And we're going to start with, uh, I, I as a child hated Donald Trump. Um, in the 80s, uh, I, I didn't like him. I didn't like the whole uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. That was, you know, I mean, he was definitely a part of that whole 1980s thing. I, I posted a quote not long ago on Instagram that talked about the idea that we were being told to say no to drugs while everybody that was like on like these private yachts doing drugs were the height of like uh, fame and fortune and what everyone was supposed to aspire to. And that was a confusing message and it, it played itself out. And here we are now where, you know, we just legalized marijuana, but we're in the middle of an opioid <laughs> epidemic that um, has killed more people this year than I think ever. I think it's the deadliest year for opioid uh, overdose uh, last year, uh, 2020. And of course, we, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it's part, that's part and parcel for the, for the course. You know, we, we change people's lives and so they can't deal with it and they move into escaping. So, so all of that uh, having been said, we want to, I do want to you know, go back to the idea that Trump ushered in an idea uh, and the idea on the grandest scale of the personal brand. And this is where we all need to be really careful because Trump's biggest accomplishment that he can achieve is putting his name on something by that being like, and and he ushered this in, he ushered in the personal brand idea and stuff in the eighties. And, and, and he was the person that you look to in terms of this idea of personal brand and putting your name on stuff. And and today you may even be, and I uh, am, you know, guilty of wanting that as well. This idea that there are tens of thousands of us looking to do the same thing. And we have to really be careful about where this is taking us because that sort of attention is, is problematic to, to say the least, because if we're going to sell our personhood, our, our, our personal as a brand, well, then we're just commodifying ourselves. 
and then our value is going to be dictated by the market. When we recover ourselves, we'll see that our height is much greater than just a vehicle for advertising. And we have to be able to see that because if we can't, then we are no more important than the market. And as we saw through the pandemic, the market isn't that important at all. <laughs> um, it's your relationships. It's, it's, it's the things that are around you that's really important. So I'm going to do my best to outline for you how addiction is associated with the past presidency and how not only was the president in active addiction, but how he, as a peddler of fear and anger, also turned into the source of addiction for millions of people on both sides. I know we all like to think of ourselves as being like, well, I'm on the good side. I'm on the good side. Well, if you're on a side, it's the wrong side. <laughs> um, we have to be able to understand that uh, where Trump is coming from so that we can work from a place of, uh, of sobriety uh, by getting angry, by wanting him to suffer, by wanting him to like, I want to get him out of office because we need to protect ourselves, right? Like, but wanting him, wanting harm to come to him or wanting harm to come to anybody that is not living in a sober way. And that is not really being, um, that's not, not being sober. Uh, you're, you're, you're living under the influence and, and you don't want to live under the influence of Trump, whether that is on a positive note or that is against him on a negative note. Like you, you want to live um, your life under your own influence. You don't want to be under the influence of uh, any of these things, uh, politics or food or drugs or whatever, because you are the most important thing um, that that you will ever experience. And so we want to start with the idea that what we see in the world is who we are, right? So that which we see in the world is us. And so we're going to talk about all the things that Trump yells about. And we're going to look at how those things resemble things that are in his life. We're going to look at enabling and how, uh, and how Trump has been enabled over the over the past few years and we're only going to touch on all of these things there's definitely we're not going to you're not going to go point by point and break all of this stuff apart i just want to give you the highlights so that you can kind of see that uh what trump has done is just take his addiction and get a whole lot of support for it so we're going to also look at transactional relationships um, the transactional relationships he's had with Mitch McConnell and Mike Pence and all of the other Republicans, of course, they're great until they're not. And once they break, and this, this, it takes two, it takes two to tango on this, right? Like, so transactional relations, people are like, I'm getting something from Trump. He's getting something from me. How much is that costing me? And we really want to look at that because if you know, um, if you if you were an addict or if you are an addict or if you know addicts, you know all about transactional relationships and you know how they can quickly uh, erode once the transaction starts to decay or once you can no longer feed the transaction the way that the addict wants. Uh, manipulation, manipulation techniques, manipulation techniques. Um, he Trump has done so many and in, in, in this second uh, round of impeachment trials or impeachment, not trials, but the impeachment vote, we saw, I don't know, 200 or so Republicans like, you know, buying into the manipulation that um, he wants a peaceful transfer of power. And like, these are all just techniques that he's utilizing to make sure that he can get his next hit of his drug of choice, which is fame or money or whatever it is he's looking for. Um, and then, and then finally coming to responsibility of the enabling bodies, right? Like we have 10 Republicans that voted against him. So they're finally seeing that their, their complicit nature and their, um, and, and what they did to provide all this. And, the, and they're finally saying, you know what? I was wrong. I'm going to go ahead and vote to uh, impeach this guy because it's not what is best for this country, right? Like we, we have to make not only a statement, but make sure that this country doesn't keep hemorrhaging resources to somebody who uh, has no intention of, uh, of, of doing us any good because, and it's not because he doesn't want to have intention to do us good. He's just living so much under the influence of his addiction that there's no way he couldn't. He can't take us into consideration. He doesn't have the ability to. And so because of that, we have to be really careful about um, 
You know, this is why this is why so many people that work in the addiction uh, in the addiction world want to get rid of stigma, because if Trump could just admit he has a problem, like we could we could step forward, right? We could we can actually make some progress. But at this point, we just have to cut him off, and and cutting him off is the best thing that we can do because we have to protect ourselves first. Um, they are making uh, the addict. Uh, Trump is making his choices, and they're only going to affect, and they're only going to improve his life um, as an addict. It's not going to improve his life completely. It's going to improve his life as an addict. And so, um, so yeah, it's a it's a it's a really complicated sort of difficult conversation. But I'm going to try and take us through it. And um, always open for your comments, uh, suggestions, and thoughts. Uh, this is uh, this may be a very divisive piece, but I'm not trying to make it that way. I'm just trying to state it as it is. And I want to start with his call to arms, make America great again. Make America great again from the beginning screamed to me, um, <laughs> screamed to me this, this, oh, you're a crackhead, right? Like, because crack is one of those things, like once you smoke it, you will never get that again, right? Like never again will you, you know, like I'm going to be vulgar a little bit. Never again will you cream your shorts um, just from taking a hit of crack, right? Like that is gone. That is gone. And, and no matter how great that first hit was, you'll never get that again. And this is what Trump's um, call to arms was. So as soon as I heard, like, let's make America great again, right? I was like, oh, wait, like, like you're chasing this thing that you can't have. The America that you are associating with being great. I mean, I, I never lived in a great America, right? Like America for me was like, I mean, I grew up in 70. I, I was born in 75. My entire world was just America as a bunch of bully assholes that are running the world, right? So America has never been great for me. For Trump, it very well may have been, right? He's white. He's rich. He's got everything that, you know, any, you know, like like any addict would want, just freedom to be in, in support of him. Because the world isn't in support, because the world doesn't, you know, like please him in a way that, uh, because he's uncomfortable in the world today, he wants to make America great again. So this starts off like four years ago. And, and I believe Trump was an addict in the 80s when I, when I witnessed him on television and other things like that as well. But it has really solidified. And at this point, the cornerstone of his entire campaign is, oh, my God, my drug of choice doesn't do it for me anymore. You all have to let's let's get that back. Let's get our drug of choice back. Let's get you know. And then this this speaks very well to white supremacy. This speaks very well to um, you know Nazi sort of uh, Confederate ideas that uh, that that people want to be able to let out. And I'm a I'm a firm believer that everyone needs to have a a, a space for conversation. Uh, meaning, I want the Confederates to be able to assemble and and do all of that stuff because it's a lot easier to identify them at that point when they're when they're hiding away you can't identify them but when they're out and they and they're proud and I don't want them to have shame like like so many people in addiction want to get rid of stigma well I want to get rid of the stigma of of being a racist right if you're a racist and you and and you don't have stigma you can say something and then a conversation can be started um if you're hiding or if you're afraid of saying that you're a racist, well, that's going to cause you to, you know, band together with other people that don't feel like they can say it. And then these conversations get really, really twisted really fast because they're not, there's no checks and balances. And so it's real important to understand that uh, when we start talking about this idea of like make America great again, there's a bigger, there's a bigger uh, uh, picture that, that, that we have to look at that said, well, why does Make America Great Again attract so many people? Um, and that's because it's a call to your drug of choice. It's a call to, I want something that I can't have anymore. And that discomfort is causing me to want uh, it even more and at any cost, right? And this is, this is the, the, you know, this is where addiction really starts to kind of take hold. So addiction tends to help us cover up hurt. Um, and so all of those people that are hurt because they don't have a voice want to be heard. They hear this message that is make America great again. And 
boom, right? Like we can we can have this explosion of what of what Trump um, as the ringleader of this, you know, this community of addicts, um, he can control that now because uh, he has the message. So we look to Mary Trump's book uh, now too much, too much is never too much and never enough. How my family created the world's most dangerous man. And that's true, right? Like, like I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the phrase too much is never enough because that is the basic translation of Gabor Mate's book in the land of hungry ghosts. So too much and never enough. That is what, that is the definition of a hungry ghost. A hungry ghost is some, is, is, is this, if you if you can imagine it is just this ghost this thing that doesn't exist that just keeps eating and eating and eating and taking and taking and taking so that book laid out the uh the addiction of trump and I didn't see anybody talking about it as addiction I saw everyone talking about it as you know childhood trauma and all this stuff and all those things are true like Trump went through some crazy childhood trauma not being paid attention to and all of these things. Well, if that's the case, isn't it obvious that he's going to want attention in his life? Isn't it obvious that he's going to want that fame? Isn't it obvious that he's going to want all of these things that he's gravitating towards? And if we were able to talk about Trump, if we were able to talk about his his presidency in terms of uh, being in a space of addiction, we might have been able to get him some motherfucking help, like so that we can actually have a conversation about like, hey, you know, this is probably a bad idea. But he he doubled down every time that he he moved forward. And um, and that's difficult. It's difficult to talk to anybody that feels like they're being ganged up against. Of course, Mary's book coming out didn't 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 engender him to her and didn't didn't open up a conversation. And and maybe he is not able to be helped in that way. And maybe he doesn't want to be helped in that way either. Then the onus is on us to remove him at that point. Um, which we didn't do. Once again, with so many enablers uh, in his camp, so many enablers in the uh, in politics right now that we're just allowing so much of this to happen. Um, now we're going to be moving into this idea that uh, everything that we everything that we see in the world is really just a reflection of us. Um, there's a New York a New York Times article about Mary Trump's book, and the title is "Mary Trump's book accuses President of embracing cheating as a way of life," um, and that's true. Now, if if we look at Trump as an addict and his mode of seeing the world and his way of life um, for the majority of it is cheating, then cheating is going to be at the tip of his tongue every chance he gets because this is how he frames the world if if cheating is a way of life to trump then everything that he witnesses is being witnessed through the eyes of cheating now i want to just look at how long ago he started the conversation around if i lose they're cheating that's probably a year and a half or two years ago like two, like two, like the middle of his, the in the middle of his presidency, in the middle of his four-year term, and he probably started it earlier. I mean, I don't know because I don't, I don't really follow politics that closely, especially when things like this are happening. Because it's like, hey, this is an addict. There's nothing you can do but hold on. But he probably started that rhetoric about two years before the election and just slowly built it up. And he truly believes that people around him are cheating. He believes that he was robbed because if he would cheat, then why wouldn't anybody else? And that's what he sees. He sees in the world around him what he is. And as he accuses people, he's pointing out his own failures and his own faults. And we see that in politicians all the time. We see it in politicians when they when they go against uh, LGBTQIA folks and then they turn out like they turn up in a in a bathroom somewhere like um, uh, uh, looking for uh, homosexual sex. It's like there is nothing wrong with being gay, lesbian, trans, bi. Nothing is wrong with those things. So why do we argue 
that? And, and why is there conversation around it? Because there's shame within the politicians. And the fact that our politicians are dealing with shame says a lot about our country, says a lot about the world today, especially because we're out here as addicts really facing our shame. And then we have our politicians who are making rules about how they're going to treat us and not looking at their own shame, not looking at their own shit, not, not doing any of their own work. And this is problematic, I think, on the grand scale. But when a president kind of takes over as an addict um, and, and now we have, to, we have to deal with this, well, we really have to change the conversation and start talking about what shame is doing to uh, the world around us. And we have to talk about addiction and how that's, and how that's affecting each and every one of us. His addiction to attention or fame is, is very predictable, and it's well documented, especially in Mary Trump's book. If you haven't read it, I would check it out. I don't know that I finished it. I mean, it's not a great book. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bore um, if, if you were to ask me, but, um, but I don't like political books, but I just, you know, like I, I, I gave it a whirl. I listened to probably half of it, and it just kind of went off the rails for me. But it's not; it's just not my thing. Um, but either way, it's well documented that that his addiction to attention and fame is 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 predictable. Um, his lack of connection and depth with his family when he was a kid, all of that really, really got him to a place of wanting to embrace base pleasures, right? These, this is, this is, this is addiction. He doesn't have any depth. He doesn't have any maturity. He doesn't have any ethics. Um, it's just simple transactions, right? Everything in his life is a transaction you're going to do for me and I'm going to do for you. And as long as we can, as long as we are in agreement on that, well, then everything's fine. Just this past week, now this is, uh, we, we had just, I'm recording this the day after, I believe, the House decided to impeach him a second time. The transactional relationships in Donald Trump's life are starting to fall apart, right? Like Donald Trump called Mike Pence a pussy. Donald Trump, you know, before, I, at the insurrection event uh, that, that stormed the Capitol, he said, you know, he was turning his back on people that are weak and, and all of this. And, and this is, this, this is the core, like, this is one of the big, big guns in the arsenal of an addict is a transactional relationship. I'm going to do for you and you are going to do for me. If you don't do for me, then I'm going to threaten everything in your life because you didn't do for me. And if you have friendships and if you have family members in which transactional relationships are at the core, I want to, you know, challenge you to challenge those relationships and try and try and get away from those transactional relationships because transactional relationships are the most unhealthy. And unfortunately, transactional relationships are the one that the ones that the market here in the United States promote the most. They want you to have transactional relationships. The more transactional relationships you have, the more fame you have. The more transactional relationships they have, the more attention you have. And the more attention you have, the better you feel, the more, and, and this is how we get social media addiction with, which Trump is definitely an addict to social media and all the fame and things that he gets coming from it. But we have to question that in ourselves as well. Where is this all going? We want to keep in check our transactional relationships. We want as few of those as possible. And if we can have them with a company rather than an individual, it would be much better. Um, and that's where they should stay. So from the beginning, we witnessed his addiction. Everything that he did was fighting to keep Trump in an addictive state. He had never questioned his addiction. He never questioned his validity. Everything he said, he would come out. I mean, I saw I saw a quote of his, or I heard a quote of his say, "I'm the president. You're fake news, right? Like, like just because you're sitting in a chair doesn't mean you get any more respect. The problem is, is we gave it to him. For me, I wouldn't have respect. I I don't respect him as a person or a president. He held the seat, big deal. Like." I didn't respect him in the 80s, and that hasn't changed. It's important to understand that like you're in control of how, uh, of how you're doing what it is you're doing. And from the beginning, we witnessed his addiction fighting to keep him entangled in it. And we can't just not see that. We have to open our eyes to the fact that this man is an addict and has been. Every time he was questioned about something that he did, he would lash out. 
He doubled down on his rhetoric and lies and accusations that he was being cheated or hard done by. These are things that you can't do to Trump, right? Because those are things that his parents did to him or whatever, right? Like you can't lie to him because he's a liar. He's going to double down on his rhetoric. And that doubling down is his addiction keeping him entangled. Because if he is going to, if he's going to admit he's wrong, then he has to go back on everything. So he just gets in too far. So it's kind of like every night, you know, I, I kind of picture this, this, this conscious in his going, you know, maybe we could just fess up. And then the other side, like unable to, 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 to put it all together says, no, we've gone too far. And because he's gone too far, he has to go further. He has to continue to go further. And this, if you don't know addiction, this is it. Like this is a, this is poster child addiction stuff. On the other hand, when he experienced any consequences, so if he had to experience a consequence of any kind, he would reframe his argument without really changing course. By being more apologetic, he would attempt to not sour that transactional relationship that he's been nurturing for so long. After all, any addict's most important thing is the next hit. And so Trump sees that when he is when he is suffering consequences, he might not be able to get his next hit. So he comes out and he does something like like when he came out and, and uh, you know, the speech that he did, that, that ridiculous speech he did uh, during the uh, during the attack on the Capitol where he came out. And he said, the first thing he said is we were robbed. Then he said, it's time to go home. And then he said that they, they're going to take it all away from us, like the win. Uh, we, can't, we can't play into the, into the hands of these people. We love you. You're special. Other people who are evil are treated better than we are. But please go home in peace. Right. So so that was like the the the, the short that's, that's the abridged version of his of his statement. If we look at that, we start with this idea that we are we were robbed. Right. He is reiterating that he's a victim. Then he says, but you got to go home. Then he says they're going to take all of this from us. They're going to take it away from all of us. So now he is taking his addiction and passing it on to everybody. He says they're taking this away from all of us. Now he's 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 really kind of buying into this idea that uh, into his own addiction and his addiction of his fame, his cult of personality, whatever you want to call it. And and as he breaks that ridiculous speech down, what he's doing is he's emboldening his. Uh, you know, his clients, his, 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 I'll call him his clients because he's their dealer, right? He is dealing them with fear and anger and frustration. And he's just, he's just soaking up all of this power from, uh, from his drug of choice, which is his own fame. So he'll, he'll come out and he'll be slightly apologetic, attempting not to sour those transactional relationships just in order to have that next hit. So he, he doesn't want to serve consequence. He doesn't want to see any consequences. And if you watch that video, he is totally high. I mean, he had to come out from watching it on television, right? He's watching it on television. He is just, he's just getting a hard on over all, uh, all these people that are, that are going in and destroying the capital of the United States. And he's loving it. And this is why it's confusing to me that there are 200 plus again, Republicans that won't see that as a reason to impeach. I, 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 with the most rational mind, I can't see how that's possible. And this must be because they are also uh, living under the influence. They, they, they have to be living under the influence or just straight lying. Uh, I don't know that there's much difference there. So this is all very clearly active addiction. When an addict sees that they have hurt their opportunity to continue engaging in their drug of choice, they are going to backtrack to a point that their enablers will support them further. So everything Trump is doing is just trying to get the people that enable him to continue traveling down this road. And we saw that uh, in the House, all but 10 continued to support and enable this president. And that's, and that's, that's not good enough. Uh, and, and this is all about, for me, bringing up this conversation so we can really have some deep conversation about the destruction of addiction. Um, his stepping back and feigning to promise a peaceful transfer of power uh, allows all of his enablers, all of his enablers to follow their beloved addict a little further. The addict knows that the enablers are going to are, have gone too far and now if they come back, they're going to think, if I give up now, I will have to admit I was wrong. And at this point, 
that is probably really hard to do. I can't imagine. Like, I'm hoping that they just think this is going to get swept under the rug and not that like, no, I'm right. They can't believe they're right, right? Like, I, I, I can't imagine they think they're right. Um, but maybe they do. And if they do, all the more power to them. I don't know. Um, I, I would assume that if they think they're right, that they are definitely under the influence. But um, not one. I'm not here to judge. So that's another area we're being guided. Like we as citizens are being guided by people living under the influence. And that's a difficult thing to face. Uh, we do want to make sure that we are um, at least being guided and being spoken to with respect and with people that are thinking clearly. Uh, this goes back to, uh, you know, when when uh, people were being accused uh, falsely of being communists. Uh, this is not this is this is this is just personal weird rhetoric that, that we really need to get get rid of from our from our uh, political system. And yet lying and money and stuff is so behind the system that uh, it's 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 going to be hard to get rid of either way. Hopefully this conversation can spur some change. So the, the historic second impeachment of a president came with 10 Republican votes, which is historic in itself. No, uh, no party of an impeached president ever voted to impeach their party's president. And this we got 10. That is huge. It's still scary to me that over 200 Republicans voted nay, but, you know. Little steps, right? Baby steps. The, I always like to say it's the, it's the tiniest shifts that make the biggest change over time. And so hopefully this was just a tiny shift, tiny ripple that will really launch everything um, moving forward into a good direction. Um, so hopefully it's a, it's, a, it's a sign of something better to come. I want to once again say that this is not an attack on Trump. To be honest, he's not worth my time to even attack like the man is it, it, I, I the man is the the littlest thing that i can think of <laughs> um but uh he is a beacon of what's to come and if we keep addiction in the closet and keep shaming those people who um have certain addictions while praising others we are uh, gonna see this happen again Addiction is not easily defined or identified, but you can always follow the wake of its destruction. And at the peak, you're gonna find someone playing the role of the ultimate victim. And that person needs some help. And that person right now is Trump. He definitely needs help, but we need to secure ourselves first. We need to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves because he is destroying us as as a country, he's destroying the, the, the democracy, he's destroying the republic, he's destroying everything that's been built. And if we saw Trump as the kind of crackhead that he is, we would have put him into an inpatient program where he couldn't do any harm to himself or others. Instead, we turned a blind eye and his wake of destruction, although not a surprise, is probably decades from being repaired, if repair is possible at all. I want to thank you for listening to this. I know this is a, this is a little off, off topic, but it is definitely on my mind and something that I wanted to put out there because uh, this, is, this is infuriating that, one, there are people that expect Trump to, to do better. Two, that he's had this mouthpiece for four years and we're only now in the last week of his presidency trying to get rid of him. He should have been, he should have been put into an inpatient program uh, probably in the 90s, but we didn't have the conversation yet. And I hope this can start the conversation. Now you can find links to everything I'm doing in the description of this episode. Please rate and review, uh, leave comments. Of course, I want to continue having conversations about how this is addiction. I'm sure many of you uh, don't believe that or want to think that I'm stupid or ignorant or what have you. And that's fine. You guys have your opinions and um, you have the right to think that. And I appreciate um, you putting that out there and making sure that you know we're all keeping ourselves in check because that's what we have to do. I just hope people can keep addicts in check um, and keep us from continuing to enable addicts. I'd love if you'd support my show at anchor.fm or support me and my work at Patreon, where you'll get access to unedited content as well as writings and one-on-one -on -one access to supporter group portrait sessions with me. 
I host workshops regularly and take a limited number of one-on-one -on -one clients every month. Contact me if you're ready to work together and recover yourself. Connect with me through martinjohn.com. And thank you for listening to the Recover Yourself podcast. And until next time, keep recovering yourself. <laughs>